I will uh, pass over to Amy to finish off her introduction, but please give her a warm welcome. Thanks, Roy. Thank you, Roy. Wow, I feel a bit of pressure now. Um, but yeah, it's lovely to be here. Um, lovely to be speaking back at Agile Yorkshire again. And, and my talk is about um, broken Agile transformations, basically. Um, so we'll get started. So as Royd was saying, um, I've been doing this quite a long time now. Um, I started out as a scrum master back in 2012 for that company that used to be called Orange Digital. It's now called EE. Um, it was actually one of the only um, agile organizations um, around, really. Uh, I didn't know of any others that were working in that way, and it was super exciting to, to go in at that time, being a scrum master. Um, and uh, since then, I've gone sort of from strength to strength, really, uh, working at various organizations, contracting, uh, then being agile coach, and then going on to specializing more uh, in uh, transformation strategy um, and agile adoption within organizations, working at senior leadership level. Um, I've worked in various verticals throughout the years, and uh, as we'll find out here today, the vertical is completely irrelevant because they all make the same mistakes. So, a little bit more about me then. Um, <laughs> um, I'm proud I'm some mischievous Margot, or magic Margot. Um, she is a cotton noodle, she's two years old, and I've said Google it because no one knows what that is. Um, and I don't have time on this talk to go through it all, to be honest, so <laughs> have a look at what a cotton noodle is. Um, but yeah, one of my bizarre hobbies is playing polo for some obscure reason. Um, I've always ridden horses ever since I was young, and uh, it's, it's the reason why in the summer I am covered in bruises and I'm quite sore. So I'm not a victim of anything underhand. I literally am involved in the wrong sport. Um, I also like playing the guitar. I'm pretty much self-taught on guitar, so I like to just accompany myself, really, doing a bit of open mic here and there when I get time. Um, I have written a couple of my own songs, but I like country music um, and folk music, and that can be kind of depressing. Uh, so I don't, I don't sing very much um, in public, um, but uh, yeah, I do love a little bit of, a, of an open mic. Um, I've recently started playing paddle a little bit. Um, that's quite fun. Um, I need to figure out how to stop whacking the ball completely out of the court because it's a lot shorter court than tennis. I don't know if you've ever played it, but uh, that's quite fun. Um, and I started sewing recently. I don't know why. Um, I just thought, let's just do this. And I made some cushion covers for some old cushions that I had. And I'm super proud of them. You have no idea how long it took for me to make those two cushions. Five months. Five months. I mean, didn't go every week, but still, <laughs> that's a really long time, isn't it, to make two cushion covers? It's really complicated. Look at all of these patterns here, just for those. Just trying to explain myself now, so I don't sound completely lame. But yes, I was very proud of them. Um, and I also love walking in the countryside, obviously, with my little dog, Margot. I'm a massive fan of the Lake District. Um, that's one of my favourite walks, Brant Fell, which is just uh, next to Windermere. And uh, Margot had the best time as well. It's a nice way to keep a young dog quiet on a night, to tire them out in the day. So that's a little bit more about me. So <clears throat> why did I decide to do this talk? Well, you know, obviously, to come and speak at Agile Yorkshire again, why wouldn't I? As Roy said, uh, I've been coming here quite a long time, uh, back in the day uh, when we were on the committees together. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so it's a great place to come and speak. But also, there's a little bit more of a more serious reason as well. You know, and I don't know how many of you are in the agile coaching space or the change agent space at all, but there seems to be um, a, a rather concerning shift in that arena at the moment where agile coach roles, scrum master roles, change agent roles to do with Agile seem to be on the decline. 
And it's quite worrying because what I'm seeing more of instead of agile coach roles and scrum master roles, product owner roles, and anything to do with transformation roles, I'm seeing more traditional roles again. Project managers, delivery leads. Now I was a delivery lead two years because it was interesting to see what that role was. And it is basically a project manager crossed over with an agile coach. <laughs> so, and I think, it's, I think it's concerning. Not in itself, that is, the, that is a sort of symptom of a bigger problem in my opinion. You know, and I started to ask myself, why are we seeing this shift? And I'm of the opinion, it's because so many organizations have tried to implement a transformation strategy and have failed. And they've not just failed once, they have failed multiple times in multiple ways. So why do they keep failing? Why do they keep failing? I have a couple of ideas based on my own experience of working with these kind of organizations for a really long time now. And for me, the number one reason is the leadership. The leadership do not make the right decisions or they don't make decisions at all. They lack experience a lot of the time. Um, and then they don't admit when they have made a mistake, hold their hands up and say, yeah, let's try again in some other way. If we think about it, how long does an agile transformation take in reality? From start to finish, from inception to completion, or to a point where we feel that we've reached organizational agility and business agility level, okay? Let's say for a bank, a complex organization, we're looking at at least five years, maybe longer, eight years, 10 years, to get all of those people to change, to be engaged, to change people's mindsets, a cultural shift. It's a long process, especially for an organization that's been running in a waterfall approach for a long time. It takes a lot to get that oil tanker turned around. So when it comes to having leadership in those spaces, and I'm, when I'm talking about leadership, I'm talking about people who are big hitting decision makers, directorate, heads of, those kind of roles, the board. How many of those people have been involved in a transformation any transformation, not just the current one that they're involved in, from start to finish. That means it needs to be in the organization for at least five years to see it through, or to see it through to a decent point. Likelihood is very few. So what happens is, or what I think is happening is, we're getting these people into these organizations that are coming in to an agile transformation, either from the beginning, they might be part of the decision at the start, but then they'll probably leave at some point and then someone else will come in. And when that someone else comes in, what if they weren't actually as knowledgeable as the other person, but they still feel they need to make their stamp, make their mark, make big changes, and they disrupt. And they do it because they want to prove themselves, they want to prove their value to the organization, disprove the last person, even if it was a good thing that they were doing, because they want to prove their value. They're under pressure to prove their value. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that's the right thing for the organization, and that's a cultural problem. So you're getting people in and out of these leadership positions at various points of the agile transformation who may or may not be as experienced as a predecessor, who may want to change a strategy, potentially for the worse, sometimes for the better. But the point is not very many are seeing it through from start to finish. So the experience of those leaders are, well, I'm used to going to an organization that's already started a transformation strategy, strategy and I'm used to getting it to here. 
Or another person might be, well, I'm used to going to an organisation when they're starting up. Or I'm used to going to an organisation when they want to do a restructure. But the point is you need all of this experience at that level to do this transformation strategy correctly. Because there are many, many, many steps along the way from getting from where we are now to where we want to be. So this is why I think we're seeing a shift. Because organisations are fatigued. People are fatigued in those organisations. They're not just fatigued from trying to adapt to change, but they're fatigued in not getting the support from the leadership that they need to succeed. Because those leadership people sometimes don't know how. And they don't admit that they don't know how. So they keep trucking on and then they'll leave. And then the people in the organisation are left behind fatigued. And someone else comes in, then someone else comes in, then someone else comes in. And so on and so forth. So I think there is an industrial fatigue at the moment with agile transformation because the wrong people have been put into the wrong roles at the wrong level with the wrong level of experience. And the people that are there that have the experience haven't been given the opportunity to make the impact that they need to. And all of these accumulatively adds up to a failure. So my talk today is going to attempt to address some of these issues. So if there are anybody, uh, uh, anyone amongst us who are in those leadership positions or positions of significant influence, or you know of someone in those positions, or if there's even people watching this talk today on the YouTube channel, who are in those positions, this talk is for you. Because I really want to help these organisations. Because I do not want agile to become a dirty word. I do not want us to start hybriding waterfall with agile again. To me, that's going backwards to 1990, you know. And I'm all for like boot cut jeans and everything, but I've moved on to skinnies. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to go back to 1990 and before that. Although the music was quite good, to be fair. But the point is, we've evolved. We should keep evolving and we shouldn't be regressing. And we need to find the courage to keep pushing on. Pushing on, pushing on, improving, improving and getting better. How do we know if an organisation needs fixing? Um, well, first of all, it's kind of like, well, what did you set out to do in the first place? As a leadership team, as an organisation, what did you set out to do in the first place? What did you aim to achieve? And have you not achieved that? And why? It's like with any change program. It could be small, it could be large. But if you've not achieved what you were hoping to achieve, which is maybe increased revenue or reduced attrition, if you haven't achieved those things, you need to ask yourself why and what are the problems that we've got? You know you need fixing if you spent a load of money on organisational change through consultancies, contractors, coaches, education, whatever, and you're still not seeing the improvements that you expected. Now, these are things that I'm going to address as well, expectations, etc. But there are telltale signs as well that even leadership surely don't miss. So I'm going to ask you guys, in your world where you guys work, you may or may not have been involved in an agile transformation, but what sort of things do you think indicate that an agile transformation has not gone to plan? 
just shout out to me, but shout loudly because I'm a little bit deaf. Still see component teams, rather like cross-functional teams, a lot of areas. Yeah, so the structure of the organisation, the organisational design isn't conducive to Agile. Yeah, any others? Leadership still drives deadlines and fixed expectations. Leadership is still working to deadlines and have those expectations. Yeah, well, that in itself isn't too bad, but if the conditions to meet a deadline are not correct, i.e. far too many features for far too short space of time, the technology doesn't allow enough deployments in order to iterate. If the test environments are shocking, etc. So again, it's to do with that's to do with the technology not being conducive, the infrastructure not being conducive, potentially, or not having the right practices and processes in place to allow teams to thrive. Anything else? Leadership just not being interested in the transformation anymore. Absolutely. Anymore, still. Yeah, that's a big one. The leadership aren't invested. They don't really care, and they think it's up to everyone else to do the work when they couldn't be more wrong, you know? And the problem is when leadership have that attitude, everyone feels it, it cascades. And again, I will talk about this because it's a, definitely a big thing, a big, big thing. So here's some of the comments that I've come up with. Nothing ever gets finished. Our tech doesn't allow us to be truly agile. So nothing ever gets finished. Why do you think this is? Why does nothing ever get finished? Changing requirements. Think, things are too big. Changing requirements, things are too big. So changes in prioritisation is the major reason why things get started and not finished. And it shows a massive lack of agility because the market's moved on, the business have decided something else is more important, and so what they've invested in has stopped and started something else. In a nutshell, this is what this is. So that shows how leadership, again, lack of a forethought, lack of understanding of their own market, lack of knowledge, lack of experience, lack of vision, lack of strategy, but lack of prioritization, lack of integrity of prioritization. Um, <clears throat> so then we end up with lots of things as work in progress, taking up all our space in our environments, paying for that space, and then leadership going, why is this, why is this environment so expensive? Why has it got so much stuff on there? Our tech doesn't allow us to be truly agile, which is what we were talking about earlier. Um, you know, we might not have, some people don't, aren't even fully on the cloud. You know, they don't have the architecture. They don't, yeah, <laughs> they don't have the architecture that Andy was talking about. You know, the sort of revolutionary work that is going on in his team for some organizations is just sky blue thinking. Why is it sky blue thinking in 2024? You know, so these are leadership decisions that are not being made, big decisions. Next, we can't be agile and deliver our strategic goals. But again, this is around expectations about um, what this gentleman here was saying. The leadership often misunderstand hugely the complexity of a transformation of which they are about to embark upon. They don't understand their own tech stack. They don't understand the implications. Now, I'm not saying that all directors and heads of need to understand in detail, but they need to understand how the complexity will affect timescales and will affect their current strategic vision for the organization in terms of revenue. What's the knock-on effect? And this isn't discovered enough before a transformation is, is set underway. Agile was always just a phase. 
just a reason to restructure. This is a sign of fatigue in an organization, of the people within an organization. This is a sign of people who've seen it all before. And again, it shows that there's been a huge lack of support along that journey. Yeah, so it's just a reason to restructure. So it's just a, it's just a way to just get rid of people, streamline again, and all that sort of stuff. And maybe there is an element of that to it, you know, because when you do undertake a proper agile transformation, then you should streamline. You should get people, um, essentially, away from a transformation that aren't conducive to it. But it shouldn't be just a phase. It should be a culture and a mindset. The teams are agile, but the leadership are not. <laughs> Again, what this gentleman was saying. You know, how many times have we seen this? How many times have we been involved in organisations like this? Um, and I've seen this right from the very beginning. You know, back in 2012 at Orange, just the squads who were agile, leadership didn't understand it, they didn't care, do what you want, as long as you deliver, I'm not bothered. But the leadership aren't, again, because lack of knowledge, lack of understanding, lack of passion, lack of caring, thinking it's everyone else's responsibility when it's not. Nobody listens. This is, again, fatigue. The teams are sick of hitting their heads against brick walls and not being heard about what the problems they face on a daily basis are especially people like engineers who have to deal with these systems that are falling apart, who have to try and do their job in environments that are stressful, that slow them down. Or agile coaches and scrum masters who are sick and tired of dealing with obstructive management. And I'm going to call them managers because they're not leaders. They're managers telling people what to do, not listening, you know. Um, we have zero predictability. Well, you're not going to have any predictability if you've got no discipline and structure in your processes. And, you know, comments like that are a sign that there is a lack of consistency in your approaches. And you need consistency in your approaches. You need to be able to predict when you might finish something. And there are ways and means that Agile can approach those problems for you. All the teams are working so differently. Now, it's OK for teams to work differently if they can achieve the end goal that they have been set out to achieve, right? If you want to do Kanban and you can predict your, um, your outputs in Kanban, OK? Um, but if all the teams are working so differently that it's a problem, then it shows that there is a lack of consistency and people are on different pages about what Agile actually means and what being Agile is and what Agile processes look like. So it could indicate a lack of education um, or a lack of discipline or just people, again, are fatigued. They just don't care anymore. You know, we we're talking about, uh, Andy was saying in his slide, you know, where when other teams tried to do and replicate what he did, they didn't do the best job in some cases. It was a little bit half arsed And this is what can happen when you scale agile. You might have a team that's set up originally that are really, really good and they're making great progress and showcasing the benefits of agility in an organization. But then it scales badly because that same rigor and discipline is not instilled into all of those teams. And you actually do need that. And I think that's a massive misconception about agile teams, it, that it's really flexible and you can sort of do what you want. If anything, it's more rigid and more disciplined and structured than waterfall is. Like Kanban, for example, you know, there's no, uh, there's no events or meetings inherent to that process. 
it's all up to the individuals in that team, the discipline within them to do those things. So, you know, that's, that's not like waterfall, is it? <laughs> you know, or even scrum for that matter. So, um, so yeah, we've done step one, and now we're on step two, which is the reset. Okay, so the first, oh, well, the second part of this is to reset. If you realize that your transformation is broken, because you get comments like that and many other things that aren't going to plan or how you expected, let's reset. And I was thinking, these are the three things that I think are important in a reset. So resetting is part of a structure um, and, a, and a strategy and a plan to give Agile another go, right? To do it better to try and rectify some problems. So we've got discovery, expectations, and prioritize. And I'll go into those three elements now. And we'll start with discovery. That's the first thing you need to do. You need to ask people, the, the, the leadership in the organization, need to try and find out how we got here. You know, we had such a great plan, apparently, and now we're here. So how did we get here? So how do you find out the answer to that question? How do you know? Well, the first thing you need to do is ask everyone. Ask everyone. Including yourself in the mirror. How did we get here? So, do whatever you want to do to get the answers to those questions of what went wrong. You could do a large scale retrospective, like a program retrospective, a divisional retrospective, a cumulative practice retrospective, anything like that, you know, to find out in a safe space, what, <laughs> how do we get here? Where do you think the problems are? Um, also surveys as well, and again, as Andy was saying, this is a difficult thing to get right, but invest in getting that information because the answers to all of the problems within an organisation lie within the people who are in that organisation. You just need to ask them. That's all you need to do. So cover your surveys to maybe talk about just culture to talk about, you know, focus on culture, focus on engineering, focusing on delivery, focusing on products, so that you can start to understand, again, which areas do you need to focus on if we're gonna give this another go? It's, it helps you prioritize, and like the surveys in Andy's uh, talk, there's 25, maybe 30 people, but it was enough to see disparity between one survey and the next, and enough to help guide prioritization. So you could also do things like post-implementation reviews, um, open door sessions and open source tools. Now by open door sessions, I mean leadership open up their doors to everyone for face-to-face -face conversations because this will promote psychological safety within the organization. It'll show that leadership are actually wanting to take accountability. They want to listen and they want to hear your thoughts. The, this has been a great idea, but I've never once seen an organization do this. Not physically. There's been organizations I've worked in where they've had um, uh, like a an intranet site where you can go and put your comments in to this uh, sort of portal that goes to leadership, um, but not something as, as informal as one-to-one -one sessions available. But the moral of the story with discovery is finding out what's gone wrong, but you need to bring leaderships and teams close because another go needs everybody's buy-in, because don't forget, everyone's fatigued. 
and then stay close. So it's no good just leadership showing up for the start, for the discovery and going, hey guys, we're really sorry. <laughs> sorry, my bad. Um, what went wrong? And we'll fix it. And then never hearing from leadership ever again. <laughs> That's not the right thing to do. They need to see it through and be consistent, be visible, show that they actually care. So going forward, the cadences um, and the practices that the organization adopts has to involve keeping leadership and teams close. And we'll talk more on that in a bit, but this is a theme that will run throughout this, this talk. Next, we're on to expectations. Now, a huge reason that agile implementations fail is because there are completely misaligned expectations of what this is going to bring the organization. You know, they think there's going to be masses, masses, mass, mass, mass um, cost savings, uh, or they're just going to be automatically earning 10 times more. Uh, you know, they're going to be able to deliver 10 times quicker. It's not going to take that long. You know, it's going to take maybe a year, when in reality, it's probably going to take five. You know, um, so expectations to be reset, to be realistic, is hugely important. Because when expectations aren't met, that's when resentment kicks in from leadership because they start pointing the fingers. Not this way, by the way. They point it everywhere else. But the plan has to be realistic in the first place. And it has to be aligned. And by aligned, I mean with all the other leaders in the organization. Because I can't think of, there's, there's countless times when I've been in organizations and this leader thinks it's a great idea, but this one wants nothing to do with it. He's just waiting to see if it'll fail and then he might get on board. Mm -mm. That's not how they can be. They need to be aligned and united because it is an operational global model that they are implementing. It's not just about tech. It is and should be a pervasive change management strategy. And by pervasive, I don't just mean it should stay in tech. It should be pervasive throughout the entire organization. Finance, HR, sales. Not straight away, but eventually. And everyone has to be on board for when that happens. <coughs> so, the aligned and realistic plan has to be created. And those leaders need to make sure that they have the right information from the right people. So if they want to implement an agile transformation, they need to speak to the tech leads. They need to speak to people in technology. They need to understand how complex their current systems are. Because there's no point in saying, yeah, we're all going to be agile, we're all going to you know, migrate to the cloud. It's going to be amazing. Yes, it will be amazing. But what are you migrating? Which bits? Which bits going first? Then what? Then what? You know, what is our um, infrastructure architecture really like? Because I've worked in places where we've got bits that belong to a completely different company by proxy. You know, the spaghetti code over here, there's this thing over here, there's this thing that if it breaks, the whole system breaks. You know? So the technology part of it is hugely important. And actually, it's not just hugely important to discuss in an agile transformation. It's hugely important to discuss with anything that the organization embarks upon. If you want a new, pro if you want a new uh, product or you want to develop something you know, new for the customer, unless you speak to your technology teams first about the complexity of what you're trying to do, 
and say, is this really complex? What does our systems look like now? Is this going to be a big job for you guys? And the answer is, uh, yeah. Then you need to start thinking, mm, is this an ROI thing? Is this actually worth it? <laughs> How many organisations have you guys worked at where they embarked on a project and it's ended up hemorrhaging money because they had no idea how complex it was from a technology perspective. <laughs> I can see you. I can see you two at the back there, smiling through each other. So <clears throat> in order to gain trust for another try, leadership needs to take accountability for the previous failures and strive to scale success, not problems, because Ultimately, it is the responsibility of all leadership to make an agile transformation successful. And by all leadership, I mean leaders at the board, leaders in the directorate, leaders at program level, and leaders at team level. So your agile coaches, they need to make sure it's successful. You know, and by obviously escalating problems, organization impediments, etc. At divisional level and technical level, tech leads, it's their responsibility. At program management lead, it's their responsibility. If they need to collaborate and then they're not being able to. You know, it's up to everybody to escalate organizational impediments to senior leadership at directorate and the board so that they, those big hitting decision makers, can make those decisions. Because we can't really blame leadership if they don't know what the problems are. And we'll talk a little bit about demigod culture in a little bit. Um, but the reason I put these circles here, of we are here and we want to be here, because there are many steps along the way to get from here to here. This is five years or longer for a large organization. There are so many steps along the way, so many small steps along the way that need to be done right and uh, tested and learned from. <clears throat> and this is where a lot of organizations fail because they don't know the practical steps of starting small. And again, like Andy said, he found, he found an area that were enthusiastic about it, about what he was doing, and they were happy for him to go ahead. The same principle applies for this, starting in a small area, getting that running really, really well, and organically scaling good stuff. But they're the practical steps that they need to understand. So again, that's complexity and the expectation around complexity needs to be, um, it, it needs to be fair, I think. Um, <clears throat> and finally, prioritise by a change backlog. Now, prioritisation in any organisation is important, whether they're agile or not. Okay, I prioritise what I do um, because I have to do that because I'm terrible, I've got ADHD and I'll be like this and then I'll be like this and I'll be like this. But that's what a lot of organisations are like. They don't prioritise and that's why things don't get finished and that's why they hemorrhage money and that's why the board get annoyed because they've lost loads of money and why, where's it gone and they don't know and it's all the tech team's fault because they keep starting things and not finishing them. So when we're coming to talk about an agile transformation, prioritizing which bits to do first is really important. So if we start over in this area, potentially because it's, it's essentially ring fenced anyway, we could probably get some really good wins over here. And then we'll take those, those learnings and then maybe we can try over here. Or something might organically emerge where a team comes through. But if we prioritize the bits that we want to do first, 
that's what's important. And, and it could be that we do the worst area first or the worst bits first, the most problematic bits. Maybe we've got some technology that is so severely lacking in being fit for purpose. Or we might go for low hanging fruit first where, like I just said, there's a team over here that are ring fenced pretty much. It would be a quick win. It would be a good showcase. Whatever method an organization chooses to prioritize, just go with it, stick with it. Don't keep changing your mind because that's how things get started and not finished, attraction isn't gained enough and you don't learn enough because you need to learn from your mistakes and then think, okay, we'll do better next time. We'll try this, try that. But priorities, not, priorities need to stay the same. Otherwise, nothing will get done. Um, and I think that's a really important element and it sounds really rigid. But if you don't stick to your priorities and what you think needs to happen and why, because you've done your discovery phase, don't forget, you've got your data, you've got your understanding, you should be able to make informed, potentially data-driven decisions around prioritization and stick to them and get your results, then move on to the next bit. Okay, so step three, I think it's important to have practices and principles in an organization. And if they don't have any, they need to write some. Because practices and principles enable a baseline measurement of maturity to be assessed. Um, and it provides um, you know, a structure for people to work towards, to, to use in their retrospectives, to understand how they are progressing in terms of their agile maturity, okay? And you can see how you've changed in maturity over time or how you might have even regressed. And it just is a really great uh, tool for guidance and steer in an organization. And P's and P's shouldn't just be for teams. It's not something that you guys have to do, not me. I think there needs to be practice and principles for leadership as well. Because practice and principles instills accountability. But it shouldn't just be about teams being accountable. Why should the teams who aren't enabled to make the big decisions, the ones that are held accountable? That doesn't make sense. So it needs to be leadership as well who have a set of practice and principles for leadership. Because I don't think having blanket PMPs for an entire organization motivates leadership enough. So I think having separate practices and principles for teams and then other practices and principles for leaders helps, move, uh, helps organizations uh, towards their uh, the culture of accountability for everyone. Um, and there's a fundamental method of keeping senior leadership teams close. Again, so good practice and principles should be around for leadership anyway. Uh, something like, for example, uh, we are engaged and available to our teams. So that would be the practice and the principle is we have regular feedback loop meetings with teams so that we can make um, best informed decisions. That's just an example. Whereas a team practice and principle might be around engineering practice. So it could be the practice being we adopt the very best engineering practices. And the principle could be something like we ensure we write and maintain comprehensive and appropriate documentation. So we're not saying we have to write a novel every time we do something. We're saying appropriate um, documentation, right? There are examples. So for leaders, 
The task for leadership is to drive organisational agility and business agility. So the difference in those two terms is that organisational agility is about methods, tools, technology, the ability to deliver to a strategy. Because if you have organisational agility where there are really great workflows, um, waste is minimal, everybody is super slick, imagine that, then you can achieve business agility. And business agility is an organisation being able to move at pace in the market. So instead of having to be reactive to what your competitor's doing, you are able to be proactive. You're able to be the front runner and you're able to be the trailblazer because whatever you decide to do, you can then turn to the teams in your organization knowing full well that they have the practice of principles and skills and ability to be able to deliver because the organization agility is slick. Leaders need to become servant leaders, not managers. They need to understand how they can relieve blockers that stand in the way of their people from being able to do what they need to do to meet the business objectives. And this is why they need to be able to make big decisions and challenge the status quo without fear. And again, that's a cultural issue with psychological safety, but it's also an experience issue of how problems can be solved in those, in those um, situations. How do they work with people to solve those problems? Are they effective or not? Leaders need unity on priorities because leaders need to talk to each other about what the overall business strategy is. What is this business trying to achieve? Yes, it's broken down into smaller bits, but as a whole, what's the business trying to achieve? And how do those leaders contribute to those achievements being met within their area? And they all need to agree on what they're all going to do. And that means they have to talk to each other. They have to communicate their visions. And they have to explain what that entails. They need to know. Because so many places I know, there isn't unity on priorities. There's a lot of jostling at that level. There's a lot of um, egos wanting to get their thing in first, or they want this and they want that, and they don't agree with this, they don't agree with that. It's a lot of squabbling. They need to stop that and become united because that is a big reason that transformations fail because lack of prioritization means things get started and not finished, and then you hemorrhage money. And if you hemorrhage money, you're not going to be around for long. So it makes sense to put personal differences aside and start thinking outside of the box of what does the organization need though? What's going on in the market? How can I help? You know, how can we work together? <clears throat> they need to be clear and, and realistic for goals for the organisation and maintain that vision. A realistic vision, by the way, because what's the point of having a vision that's so unbelievably unrealistic? You can have blue sky thinking, absolutely, but make sure that you understand that to get to there is going to be a long, long time. So just be clear on what your vision is for now. What's your vision for now? We'll worry about all that later, but if we can prove that we can meet this vision, so it might be 
uh, two divisions are, you know, up and running in uh, scrum teams by the end of 2026, for example. And then scale, 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 etc. But my point is, be clear and realistic on the goals for the organisation, whether it be for the organisational transformation, or whether it be for business strategy goals, whatever it is. But these things contribute to agile transformations failing. So to fix that, be clear on your vision, be clear on your prioritization, stick to it. Um, use data-driven decision-making, not emotional decision-making. So again, it goes back to, well, I want this, and I want that, and I want this, and I want that. Stop squabbling and think about what does the organization need? What do our customers need? Okay, so use data to make decisions, not, well, I think, because I can't remember the amount of times where leaders has essentially gone, well, I think we need to do this, and then everyone's gone, oh, oh God, okay, and then they go off and do it, and it's like, why, did you, why though, why did you think that? What evidence did you have apart from what you just thought of in that second in that meeting? These are things that hemorrhage money in organizations. These snap decisions, well, I think this. Mm. So it needs when I talk about critical thinking. This is an, a, a really new concept, actually. Well, it's not a new concept, but it's a concept that's being introduced in a new way to agile and, and transformation and leadership. Because critical thinking challenges what is known as heuristic thinking, thinking that has always been. You know, naturally as people, our brains work really fast. Or if you're like me and you've got ADHD, they work super fast. And it's like, you get from A to B, like that. Because your brain is kind of lazy. It wants to get there quick. So it's really easy to rely on heuristic thinking. Like, well, we've done that before, we'll do that again. Let's used to do that. But actually, what if we don't? Yes, that worked for that situation. That strategy worked then in that organization with those people on that platform at that time. But who's to say that we can replicate that? And, let's, and who's to even say that the market is in a position for us to do that again? The market might have moved on. People's Opinions have changed, you know, so heuristic thinking needs to be challenged because that's how organizational transformations fail. You can, I'll just do this again. I'll just do that. There's no learning. There's no challenging the status quo. And challenging the status quo is a sure way to always succeed. If you at least challenge it, if you at least think about it enough to challenge it without relying even subconsciously on heuristic thinking. And then finally, agile mindsets. Um, what's best for the organization over what's best for me? What's best for my career? What's best for me? What do I want to do? You know, the best leaders don't think like that. They think about what's best for the organization. And then practice and principles for teams is simply based around them being able to adopt an agile mindset of continually improving um, in order to deliver what is asked on time without compromising on quality. And I'll talk about the agile mindset and make that clear in a few slides time. But do it right, do it well. <laughs> Going back to Andy's uh, talk as well. And uh, go back to basics if you have to. Because a lot of these transformations have been going on so long that the original education that was given to everybody at the start of the transformation on Scrum and Kanban and you know, test-driven development and all those kind of engineering practices around uh, agile ways of working and what sprints are and all that. It was so long ago 
people just have forgotten what the correct way to do things is, what good looks like, because they're so used to this way. So, you know, sometimes it's good to go back to basics. Start from scratch. Um, step forward around cultural shifts. A massive element of transformation failures is because the culture is not conducive to that change. And that's because of leadership. It is the leadership's responsibility to ensure that an agile transformation is successful, ultimately. So, you know, when they're not invested and not bothered and not involved, they are part of that problem. So, culture shifts cascade from leadership behavior. And that's not just leadership at directorate or board level, it's actually leadership in teams as well. Um, I've worked in teams where developers have come over to my team, where I've been coaching, and they've gone, oh, this is so much nicer, this is so much better, and they're so much happier, because in retrospect, as we can be honest, and we can have constructive uh, conversations around differences of opinions in a safe space, it makes a big difference. Um, but it's up to leadership to instill psychological safety throughout the organisation. And they need to lead by example. So doing things like the open door, like I mentioned at the beginning, is a great way to kick that sort of behaviour off. Um, so these are examples of which are not conducive to agile transformation strategies when we see it in leadership. And these, fixing these problems is going to make sure that an, another try will be successful. So we all know of leaders or managers in our organisation that have these traits of, you know, they've got egos that come in and they want to make changes, and they want to do this, and they want to do that, and, you know, they're led by their, their egos. They're ignorant, not interested. That's your job. You know, they adopt this demigod culture of, I'm so far up here, and you're so far down, I, I'm, I'm too good to speak to you. Because what that does, is it reverses as well, where managers at mid-level don't dare speak to them, don't dare tell them what's really going on. So actually, they never get really informed. So they're constantly getting their ego plumped, going, oh, yes, oh, yes, you're, yes, everything's fine. It was going very well. That's a great idea what you had. So they're there thinking, oh, I'm amazing. Look at all this that I'm doing. When actually, if you uncover <laughs> under the surface, everybody is crying, everybody is fatigued, everybody is tired, everyone's fed up, everyone's looking for another job. So when leadership demonstrates an approachable behavior in themselves and a, and a behavior and traits of caring about the organization and its success, by proxy, they are able to find out what the problems are. Because you can't just find out what the problems are at the beginning. You've got to stay close. You know, going back to teams and leaders need to be close. You've got to stay close, keep close, to keep finding out what the problems are. Because you'll have moments of massive, uh, masses of uh, improvements and it'll be fantastic but then there'll be lulls as well there'll be bigger more complex problems to solve so stay close know what's going on yeah so that demigod culture it needs to stop they are human beings just like you and me you know they're not special and most of the time not that good so 
arrogance falls into that as well, that, you know, I know everything, I know everything. And I have a story that I'm going to share with you, um, which shows, you, you know, uh, of an experience of my own when I was a leader. Um, but servant leadership is what's needed in organisations. Again, we've mentioned this. And servant leadership is about other people. It's about serving others. What can I do for you? And it's actually really interesting because in, um, in any literature that talks about relationships in general, especially romantic or intimate relationships, the most successful relationships are when people want to know how they can help each other. How can I help you? And toxic relationships revolve around what can you do for me? So servant leadership is about people. And I learned so much about this in one of my roles. And I'll share that with you in a minute. Support human beings. We've come a long way since Victorian times, or we should have. We should have come a long way where everything's on a conveyor belt and all managers care about is how much throughput we can get through on a daily basis. You know, where we clock in and clock out, where we're micromanaged. I'd like to think we've come a long way since then, although on the latter part, I know some organisations are definitely not on that pathway. But... <clears throat> Supporting human beings is what will keep those, all, those people motivated to want to be better, to want to give this another go, to want to fix this problem. You know, since COVID, the world has changed a lot. People are working from home a lot more now. And you know what? That's great. I am so happy to be doing that. And I'm sure lots of you are too. It's nice to see people... But I just really like being at home with my dog. You know, I really like being at home with my dog. And supporting people on how they can work to the best of their ability is what organisations and leaders need to be adopting. You know, with, there's a lot more awareness of neurodiversity, of what people need personally in order to succeed, because we've got lives. We've got stuff going on. You know, we can't come into work and be robotic as if nothing's going on on the outside or if, as if nothing's going on in here or in here. OK, so supporting people as human beings, I think, is really important. And reward behavioural shifts. So, again, this is when agile starts to be pervasive. So things like this should be incorporated into a bonus structure via HR. Instead of about, how much did you make today? How much code did you fix? How many tests did you run? How many bugs did you find? You know, how many features did you release? It's all, actually, how did you personally align with our practices and principles? How did you personally contribute to scaling something really positive within the Agile framework? You know, how did you influence someone else to give it a go who wasn't sure? That sort of thing. <clears throat> Let's talk about vulnerability because true leadership should be able to show vulnerability. <clears throat> and I've already been a little bit vulnerable with you today in terms of my ADHD. So has anyone got anything that they think shows vulnerability from someone, not necessarily just a leader, but from someone in general? What shows vulnerability to you? Admitting to mistakes. Admitting to mistakes. Admitting Absolutely. To mistakes. Humility. Of... And what was that? I disagree. I think that's a strength. Someone who can't... But it's a strength. It is a strength to be vulnerable. To be able to show vulnerability is a strength. So to admit that you've made a mistake shows strength of character. Because when you admit that you're wrong, it's, you feel vulnerable, don't you? You think, oh, God, how will people react to that? Will they be angry? Will they think I'm rubbish at my job? 
it puts you in a vulnerable position because people might be then dismissive and go, oh, well, yeah, you did. You really messed it up, didn't you? You know, people might react like that. So it puts you, being vulnerable puts you in a position that is kind of trepidatious. You're not sure how people react. But it's very important for a leadership. Now, I'm going to tell you a little story about when I was um, working as a head of Agile and I had about 30 odd coaches. Now, bearing in mind, this is way before I knew that I had ADHD and that does count for a lot. <laughs> I will say that now. But I went in there thinking that a leader meant that I need to tell other people what to do because I thought, well, I know more than them and I've done this more and longer. So they just need to sort of do as I tell them and then it will work. That was what was going on in my head. <clears throat> so in a roundabout way, it was coming from a good place about what was best for the organization. But I hadn't taken into account these things. Definitely not these. Um, and I realized it took me ages to realize because I was under a lot of pressure to deliver that job. So this is why I do understand when leaders feel the need to put their stamp on things and feel the need to do things. But what I understood is that actually, these people have all got their own experiences and their own strengths. And I started to understand that I can't do this without them. You know, regardless of their experience level, they could all help me in whatever way. So I changed my, uh, my sort of approach from being very directive and you will do this and you will do that. I look back now and I think, oh my God, I can't believe I was like that. And I, you know, I just can't now looking back. But cultural uh, pressures, et cetera, that's why I was. I just really wanted them to be the best that they could be super quick. And just was like, right, you need to do this now. You do this, you do this. But once I started changing the way that I approached that problem of how can we all work to figure this out and engaged with them, it was so much better. And they stopped seeing me as this dragon, <laughs> I think, and more of a proper collaborative leader. And it felt so good. This is the thing that if any leaders watch this, it felt so good to be like that. I stopped going home, stressing out, not sleeping at night to suddenly feeling like it's going to be OK. They're all on board. They're going to help. We're going to get through this together. Um, and it felt a lot better. And I think if I learned anything from that time, it was more about myself and leadership than implementing agile transformation strategies. And if every leader can take that approach, that would be truly amazing. So I'm just going to, I think I'm conscious of time, so I'm just going to skip through the agile mindset bit because I think much of you probably are aware. And, you know, there's just basically four pillars and I thought it'd be quite fun to put this tarot card in because four, historically, or in numerology, is around um, stability, structure, that sort of thing. And there's four pillars, so, you know, almost like strong foundations. Step five is embody your tech mindset. And instead of thinking of your organization as, we are a bank, we are a television company, we are, um, we are a, a betting shop or a betting company, you need to start thinking, we are a technology company specializing in banking. We are a technology company specializing in betting and gaming. Because once you start putting technology at the forefront of your agile um, transformation strategy, you will then allow an environment that is in conducive to organizational agility. So investing in technology to, be, to enable pace in today's market, invest in your engineers, nurture and develop them. Again, talking about focusing on people. It sets the pathway towards organizational agility. So obviously invest, 
in your, in, your, um, in your engineers, which will eventually return your investment back to you through lack of attrition and also through developing high quality uh, products and features in good time. But failure to invest in technology is in itself a failure. So in order to prevent failure and to fix a broken agile transformation, which may revolve around technology not being invested in, make sure that you're doing everything you can to invest in it. Step six is organizational design. So the organization must be designed around technology. So focus on one area at a time. So if technology needs to improve in one area, do it. See how it works. See how you can scale that. So you don't scale problems and test and learn from that. Make sure that the problems are not scaled throughout the organization. Leaders need to be ready to make some big decisions based on what is best for the organization and not themselves. Foster a test and learn mindset. So again, transformations fail because there's no MVP mindset. You know, and they're like still thinking old school, big, when we're gonna get all these features in, when we do this, when we do, you know, that's not what agile transformation is. Focus on MVPs, the, the minimum viable product, and then deliver incrementally. But again, keep leaderships and teams close. Remember the fundamental aspect of return on investment. So you've got to always be aware as a leader, is this returning on the investment? Is this costing too much now? Do we need to pivot? Next, we've got structure and discipline. So set up cadences to the right people at the right time, speaking in the right level of detail. So agile transformations fail because people aren't talking enough, whatever level it is. So it might be the leaders up here, directorate aren't talking enough. They don't know what's going on. At program level, they're not talking. Or even at team level, they're not talking. But make sure that cadences are set up throughout the organization. You can do that through demos, and you can do that through other, other means, regular meetings, whatever, but make sure that everyone's talking. That's when explicit knowledge becomes tacit knowledge. Explicit knowledge being uh, academic by the book to tacit knowledge being knowledge from experience. Step nine is keep continuously, continuously improving, and that is um, you know, massive way marker of what agile transformation looks like. If you stop improving and, re and actually regressing, then that is how your transformation is going to fail. You have to keep pushing on with design, process, technology, and culture. You have to keep pushing uh, towards organization agility and business agility. And you can use your practice and principles to help drive all of these. But process needs to facilitate alignment and priorities um, constantly, because otherwise that's how things get started, not finished, uh, and that's how teams can deliver what the organization actually needs um, first time. Keep continually improving on technology. Strive to be the best. In Agile, uh, there are sayings of you have to uh, buy the best you can afford. And that comes to technology and your people. And finally, culture. Leadership and team mindsets need to live the cultural values. When that falls apart, your transformation will fail because hearts and minds will be lost, fall into fatigue again. And finally, step 10, keep listening. Everyone needs to keep listening to everyone but all the answers, like I said at the start, to all the problems within an organization lie within the people who work in that organization. So you just need to ask. Bring, and again, just reiterating, bring leadership and teams close. Set up your structures to bring leadership and teams close. Because another go needs everyone's buy-in, and then, 
stay close. Thank you, everybody. Thank <laughs> you.